Do me a favor, take your copy of God's Word and turn to John chapter 6, the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. We're going to talk about bread, and I love bread. I think I got it from my mom because she got it from her mom. I can remember going to Grandma Jolly's house, and it seemed like every time we walked in the front door, she was pulling a pan of biscuits out of the oven, and she would always ask, you want some biscuits? And I would say, Yes, in the name of Jesus. And so I, I've always loved bread, so I stopped by Panera just to get a piece of bread, but I couldn't choose because they had some beautiful croissants and this Asiago something or another and French baguettes and then a ciabatta or something I can't pronounce and then a loaf of sourdough. Oh, my, I love bread. I, I feel kind of like the guy who went to a restaurant. He was new in town, and he sat down, and he asked the waitress, can I have some bread? And she brought him a slice of bread. And he ate it, and then he said, you know, um, is that all you've got? Could I have some more bread? And she brought out a couple more slices of bread. As he got ready to leave, he left a generous tip, and otherwise he was very nice, but he said, I just, I just have you know, you're kind of stingy on the bread. But he went back next time, and she remembered the tip, so next time he showed up, time he sat down, she gave him four slices of bread. He smiled, but after he ate those four slices, he, he said, you, you think I could have a little more? She brought him a couple more slices, so he had six slices of bread. And when he left, he left another generous tip, and he said, you know, it's getting better, but I, I still, I think you're kind of holding back on the bread. The next time when he walked in the restaurant, she was ready for him. She brought him a whole loaf of bread. He ate every slice. And then as he got ready to leave, he said, so that's the best you can do. So the manager had had it. I mean, they had played nice long enough. The manager baked something special, knowing that now he was a regular. The next time he came in, the manager came out. They had baked a loaf of bread six feet long, three feet wide. It took the manager and three other servers, all of them, to walk it out. They walked it out to the table. And he just looked at them. And he said, so we're back to one piece now, huh? <laughs> See, that's what happens when you're just trying to fill up on bread. You never get enough. And see, I don't just like bread. I like stuff. And so my tendency in life is just to fill up on stuff and to feel like I've got to get more and more stuff. And, and in fact, if I'm, if I'm not careful when I pray or when I read the Bible, I will think, God, don't you just want to give me some more stuff? And that's a perversion of the gospel. The gospel means good news, and perversion means bad and fake and false. And, and so a fake gospel is that if you just say the right things or if you just pray the right things, if you believe the right things, then God wants to multiply your stuff. He wants to give you more bread. But that's not the gospel. The gospel teaches us this, that Jesus did not come primarily to give us bread. He came to be our bread. And that's the main thing I want you to understand today. Jesus, in his coming, God becoming man, he didn't do that just to give us more stuff. He didn't do that so that we might have more bread. He, he came to be our bread. And that fits so well in our conversation with the gospel. That's what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks, the gospel, which means good news. And, and when we understand that God loves us so much that he became one of us and that as one of us, he died and, and he, paid, he paid for what we had earned. We had earned death, but he took our death, and, but he didn't stay dead and he, he rose from the dead and he lives today. That is the gospel and the gospel is good news. And, and I really think if I understand that, then I want to share the good news. I want other people to hear that I've got some good news. And so we've been talking about how to live out and how to share the gospel. Last week I gave you a simple way to do that. We call it three circles. And I said you could start with that first circle that just reminds you that God has a design. And his design is a love relationship with you because he wants to fellowship with you. He, he wants you to worship him. He wants to walk hand in hand with you. But something gets in the way of that design. And that something is called sin. And the Bible says all of us sin. 
And sin is any time we do the bad things that God said, don't do that. And it's any time we don't do the good things that God says, you should do this. And any of that sin, whether it's one or one million, our sins separate us from God because God is holy. And so when we're sinful, it's like oil and water that doesn't mix. And so what that leads to is it leads to our brokenness. And if you've lived a little bit of life, you understand brokenness, that relationships don't always turn out the way you want them to, and families are sometimes broken, and you start out on a career path, and it doesn't go the way you planned, and your dreams are broken and shattered. And we recognize that broken lives are no fun, and who wants to live in a, in a state of brokenness? And, and so we have to try to, how do I get back to, to God's design? How do I get back to where He wants me to? And that's what takes me to that third circle, which is gospel, which means what? Good news. And the good news is there's a way back. There's a way back to God's design, and that's through the person of Jesus Christ. And, and when I repent, it's a word which means when I turn. So when I turn to Jesus and begin to follow Him, when I repent and when I believe in who Jesus is, then... I can get back on that path toward God's design. I can restore my relationship with God, and I can pursue who Jesus is. And I told you last week that if you just take those three circles, you can use that little booklet we gave you, or you can download the app that helps illustrate that for you. Or you could just do like I did with my friend Leah this week. And after she had served us and, and we had prayed for her, she recognized me, not because I'd asked for more bread, but because I'd been there before. And she said, you're a pastor, aren't you? I said, yeah, I'm a pastor, Leah. And she said, I, I think I need to be in church. And I said, well, you probably do. But I said, you got just a minute? And she had a tray. I said, go put the tray down and, and hand me that pen you got in your little pocket there. And, and so she put her tray down and I took the pen and I turned over a napkin and I just said, let me tell you what's even more important than church, and I can do that just by drawing three circles. I, I tell you that because that was one of the opportunities I used this week to do what we talked about. How about you? Did you find opportunity to have divine appointments to share the truth of God in a regular way with people that you came in contact with? Well, you, you see, when we're living like Jesus, that's what happens. It's not some program. It, it's, it's not something that we do robotically, but just out of the flow of everyday life, when we're living like Jesus, ordinary people like us, we can turn everyday conversations into gospel opportunities. And I really believe that's the secret. You see, in this room, there's one of two categories that we're all in. You're either already a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm just telling you, the way Scripture explains it, gospel opportunities and gospel conversations should be a part of your life. That should be a part of how you regularly live out your daily existence. And so you should want to say, how do I become more effective at that? How does that become more natural so that just me, an ordinary person, can turn everyday type conversations into gospel opportunities. If you're not in that category, you're in the category of a person who needs to have a gospel conversation. And the good news is you're going to hear that again and again and again today. You're going to hear that, that God loves you and that He does want that ideal plan for your life and that no matter how broken you are, He can fix you and He just wants you to turn to Him. That is the good news and we're going to talk about that again in the context of an interaction that Jesus had with a bunch of people. But before we do that, I want to pray once more and just ask God to meet us here, to speak clearly, and then to, to enact whatever change needs to be enacted in our life. So you ready? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask, speak. Oh, God, give us those things that we don't have. We come open-handed and needy. Lord, teach us those things we don't know. We confess our ignorance. We, we confess that there's so much about you that we don't know. And then make us what we've not become. God, your word says if any one of us is in Christ, we are a new creation. And, and yet there's a lot of us, Lord, that are living like the old us. 
Make us what we've not yet become, Lord. Begin that transformation process in our lives. Help us to walk away different. And God, I include me in that category. So, Lord, I ask you, let the words I say in my thoughts in these next few moments, let them be pleasing and honorable to you, God. You have changed me, and, and I want that to be demonstrated in our time together for your glory. And most of all, God, I would ask that you do that greatest miracle of all time today. That someone who's in that category where they don't know you, they're not sure about eternity. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. And I thank you for this, because I know that's within your will. And I ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, as the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And so both then and now, that's why many people come to God, right? They come wanting God to show them something. God, if you just give me a sign, then, then I'm going to tune in. God, if you just make it clear, more clear than it is and has been, then, God, I, I'm going to listen. Then I'm going to respond in a way that maybe you want me to respond. But first, God, I, I need you to do a sign. And, and what we're saying is, God, I'm more concerned about you giving me bread than I am about you being the bread. God, I'm more concerned about what you can do for me than that you are for me. Verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. And now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip. Now he's setting Philip up. Jesus sees the situation. Just say this with me. Say, God sees. Maybe you need to be reminded of that. God sees everything you're facing. God sees everything you're going through. So Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread so that these people may eat? But he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Say, God knows. God sees and he knows. Jesus knew what he was going to do. But Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Verse 6 says, he said this to test him. And I just want to remind you that some God, sometimes God allows things to happen in our life to test us to see if we're going to respond to him because God is sovereign, right? Sovereign means he's the king, he's the ruler, he's sitting on his throne. He's never caught off guard by the circumstances of life. Nothing ever touches you that causes him to go, oh, wow, I didn't see that one coming. Nothing, in fact, ever touches your life that hasn't first filtered through his hand. So God knew what was going to happen, but he's turning to Philip to see if Philip was going to trust the one he's been hanging out with. And so Jesus asked a where question. Where are we going to get the food to feed all these people? And Philip responds with a how answer. He says, well, it's going to take about 200 denarii. No, 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 no. I didn't ask you where are you going to get the money from. I said, where, where are we going to feed these people from? And, and you need to understand that because you and I do that. God wants us to look to Him. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to see that He's the source. And too often, we get stuck on the how. Oh, I don't know, God. I don't think you can do that. I think that may be big even for you, God. Jesus was trying to get them to look to Him. But I, I, I want you to see something else there. Not only was that reality... Jesus was helping them to see that he's the one who provides. Do you remember the Old Testament story of Abraham? God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. So Abraham starts going up the mountain, and he's got Isaac with him, and they're going up for a sacrifice. Isaac knows that, and then he begins to look around, and he says, uh, Time out, Daddy. Um, where's the animal? Where's the one who's going to be sacrificed? And Abraham says what? God will provide the lamb. So Jesus is just trying to point them to this understanding that they should have already known, that God will provide, that he's sufficient. How may change, but where never changes. Jesus is the answer to your, your questions. Jesus is the answer to your problems. You get that call from the doctor and you have that unexpected illness, Jesus is the answer. Your marriage 
faces difficulty or this other relationship you're in has challenges, Jesus is the answer. Your career is not going the way you think it should be going. Jesus is the answer because He is the source of all that is good in your life. Verse 8 says this, And then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Now I've got to stop there because how would you like to be known as Andrew, Simon Peter's brother? I got a little taste of that when I was in ninth grade algebra when Miss Cook, and I promise I'm not bitter, but Miss Cook, who had my brother who's nine years older, one day she said, I guess you're just not as smart as Rocky, are you? I'm like, Andrew, Simon, why is he known as Andrew, Simon Peter's brother? I want you to know something. Do you know in John chapter 1 and verse 40, it says one of the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. That's when we first hear of him. And notice what it says. He first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. The reason Andrew is always known as Simon Peter's brother is because Simon Peter would have never known Jesus were it not for Andrew. Peter, who denied Christ, Peter, who would preach at Pentecost, Peter, who God would use to birth the church, Peter, this great apostle, we only know about Peter because his brother brought him to Jesus. Here's my question for you. Who have you brought to Jesus? You see, a lot of us are are like me. We've, We've lived professing to have followed Christ a long time. Who have you brought to Jesus? We all should have at least somebody that we're consciously, consistently, actively praying for, investing in. That one person that we're saying, oh God, open the eyes of their heart that they might know you. It's a friend, it's a family member, it's a co-worker, it's a neighbor. Who's your one? I hope you would take a moment right now and just, whether it's in the the cover of your Bible or in a notebook or, or, or wherever you can write it. Write down that name, at least the first name of the person that you want God to use you to bring to Jesus. Well, notice what happens. Verse 9, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. <laughs> and I think this is a cool moment too because it's like Jesus is saying, y'all relax, relax. And watch this. It's like he was saying, take a deep breath. Maybe you need to do that. Just Let's do that together. Take a deep breath. So some of you, you've come in, even to church, and man, the week has just beat you up. And life has got you down. And you're overwhelmed. And sometimes it's good just to take that deep breath. And just watch Jesus work. So it says, now there were much grass in the place, and the men sat down, and there were about 5,000 in number. We know, we call it the feeding of the 5,000, but there's fifteen or 20,000 people there, because there were just 5,000 men. It says in verse 11 that Jesus then took the loaves, and, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and and they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who's come into the world. Wow. Jesus showed up. He demonstrated his power through his presence, and people began to notice who he was. Now, on the outset, this seems like a miracle of multiplication, right? And that's the kind of thing that causes us to buy into this faulty or fake gospel. God just wants to give me more bread. He just wants to multiply what I have. But that's not the point. The point was not the bread in the baskets. The point was that Jesus was in their midst. That because of the presence of Jesus, every need they had would be met. He wanted them to understand, and I believe he wants us to understand today, if we really see Jesus for who he is, every need in our lives will be met. 
Remember the main point of the message. Jesus did not come primarily to give us bread, but to be our bread. So what happens next? We're told that Jesus pulls aside. And he did that often, by the way. He exercises Sabbath. And he spent time with God. So if Jesus needed to do that, probably you do too. But he pulled away, he went to the top of the hill, and the disciples went out on the boat. But something happened, and Jesus noted that the disciples out on the boat were in the midst of a stormy gale. The wind was blowing, the waves were tossing. And that's when we have that other familiar miracle, right? Jesus walks on the water. And Jesus walks on the water, and then he gets in the boat. But in John's account of this, never do we see that the storm stops. Because the point wasn't that Jesus calmed the sea. The point was that Jesus was present, and that if Jesus is present, that is always enough. And and I need you to understand, in our lives, often we're focused on the storm. We're focused on the waves. We feel tossed about in the wind. We're overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. And even those of us who profess to follow of Christ, too often we're not depending on the fact that Jesus is with us. And that Jesus is with us, that's enough. The point of this whole chapter, the point of the gospel is not what God can do for us, but that God is for us and that he is with us and that if Jesus is with us, we can endure whatever is taking place around us. Verse 22, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into the boats and they went to Capernaum. They were seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, when did you come here? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, Jesus is saying, I get it, guys. You're not coming to me because you've got it because you really understand who I am, because you know I'm the Messiah, because you know that if I'm with you, you can endure anything. You're coming for me because your stomach's growling again. You want more bread. But Jesus had a message, and his message was, I didn't come primarily to give you bread. I came primarily to be your bread. We're still learning that, aren't we? Our our natural tendency, our natural draw is to feel like we do something for God and and He does something for us. And so that's kind of where the conversation went in verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him, God the Father has set His seal. And then they said to Him, okay, so what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. In other words, it's not what you do, it's what you believe. We want to be doing the right things. We want to to think, man, if if I just follow this list of rules, or if I come to church enough, or if I give, or if I pray this way, or if I dress a certain way, or if I read this translation of the Bible, then maybe what I do will be enough. And then maybe I'll get more bread. Maybe then he'll meet my needs because he'll see what I'm doing. And if you think the secret is in what you're doing, then that kind of makes sense. But what Jesus was saying is so much more simple than that. See, as we read through the New Testament, we see that people around Jesus always tried to complicate that which was simple. And yet Jesus, he came to simplify that which is complicated. I know you can't understand that there's a God in heaven and that he wants a personal relationship with you. But I'm telling you, all you've got to do is believe, Jesus would say. You think they got it? Well, let's keep reading. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? 
wait, what? I mean, we don't know if they had seen him walking on water or not, but what we know is they knew about the miracle on the mountain. They knew about the bread. And they wanted more signs. I mean, really? You, if you give me one more sign, then I'm going to believe. You, you see, you think it, if you think it's about what you do, it's never going to be enough. If you think it's what he can do for you, it's never going to be enough. And some of you, you've taken this story from the Old Testament, a story that's descriptive, was never intended to be prescriptive, the story of Gideon, and where Gideon talks about putting out a fleece, and so this is what you've done, I'm going to put out a fleece for God. That's Gideon's story. It wasn't intended to be a prescription for how you live. As we read the Scriptures, usually if someone says, God, show me a sign, if you show me a sign, then I'll do what you want me to do, that's a lack of faith, not a sign of faith. And so you're not faithful in your financial stewardship. And you say, oh God, if you just, if you just help me pay this bill, then I'm going to start being faithful to you. Or, or you're not faithful as a witness for Christ. And you say, oh God, if, 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 you know, if, if you just do this over here, then I'll tell others about you. Or you're not faithful even in just attending or, or being a regular part or being involved. And you say, oh God, if I can just get this straightened out or get my kids through this situation, then I'm going to be faithful. And it's never enough because that's like trying to eat more and more and more bread. It's never, ever, ever going to be enough. See, if you come to Jesus because of what he can do for you, you'll always want him to do more. But if you come to Jesus for who he is, you'll always understand that he's enough. That was good, so I'm going to say it again. If you come to Jesus because of what he can do for you, you're always going to want him to do more. But if you come to Jesus just because of who he is, he will always be enough. So what did they do now? I mean, Jesus had kind of... Put it right there before them. What did they do? They did what some of you do. They played the comparison game. Have you ever done that? I don't know. I mean, I don't think they go to church like I do. They're not faithful. I mean, they probably don't give. And look at them. They're driving a new car. I can't even get mine out of the shop. Kind of. That's what they did. Well, Jesus, remember our forefathers in the wilderness? They had manna. Why don't you just give us an endless supply of bread, fish? They had manna. I mean, you remember that story, right? Manna, God provided for them. They were grateful. And it got kind of old. They had to be creative. I mean, they would have banana pudding and banana bread. I mean, some nights they would have mam- manicotti maybe. I mean, so, and so Jesus had to respond to this and say, it's, it's not about your comparison, don't get idolatrous over what you have. Do you understand that? We, when we make it about the bread, that's become an idol in our life. That's become more important to us than the one who's given us everything we have. And I would remind you, there's nothing that you have that he didn't give you for one purpose. And that is to bring him glory. So what did Jesus say? Look at verse 32. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave them the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So now they're like the woman at the well. Remember when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well? And he said, I know, you, honey, you're thirsty, but if you would just drink the living water, then you would never thirst again. And she's like, oh, yeah, give me some of that living water. And he says, go get your husband. And then that's when things kind of got crazy, right? <laughs> well, here the same way. He says, if you just had this bread, you would never be hungry. And so now they're eager. Okay, yeah, we want some of that bread. Give us this bread. What did Jesus say? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I've said to you, you've seen me. And yet you do not believe. What's the message of John 6? simple. All you need is Jesus. 
Just Jesus. Jesus didn't say, I am the giver of bread. I'm the maker of bread. He just said, I'm the bread. We have a big problem and a big misunderstanding when it comes to how we want God for more of what we get rather than simply for more of who He is. We want the gifts more than the giver. When I travel, whether it's an international mission trip or a convention, a conference, speaking engagement, it's not unusual that when I come home, I bring a gift. Now, I have to tell you, sometime through the years, it was kind of a last-minute addition. Sorry, kids, but it might have been the, the airport gift shop, if you know what I mean, right? But you know what I don't want when I get home? I don't want my kiddos running up to me and go, where's our gift? I want them running up to me and just loving on the giver. I don't want them to want the gift more than they love the giver. And yet that's what some of us do when it comes to wanting more bread. We're so focused on what we think we need and what we want from God that we're not giving Him our all. I need you to understand that the way to God is not a path. It's not a program. It's not a plan. The way to God is a person. It's, it's Jesus. It's just Jesus. So don't spend your life pursuing more bread, more stuff. Spend your life running after Jesus. And when you run after Jesus, everything else will begin to fall into place. When Jesus begins to be your pursuit your life will begin to look more and more like Him. And remember what happens when your life begins to look like Him. When we look and we live like Jesus, ordinary people like us, we turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations because we're always pointing back to Him. When someone looks at you and they talks about, talk about how things are going in your life, what if you just got in the habit of saying, it's just Jesus. <laughs> Anything good in me is Jesus. When people see that you've been blessed, if you have, and you've got things that others don't have, man, be quick to point back to Jesus. Because the Bible says anything that you have that is good came down from the giver. Don't get focused on the bread. Focus on the bread. And the reason this is so important is because these problems come into our life and people need to know there's hope. They need to know that when the bread runs out, there's one who gives them everything they need. They need to know that when the doctor calls and gives them the bad report, that that's not the end of their story. And they need to know that whatever happens on this side of heaven pales in comparison of the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God. We live in a world that's filled with bad news. But that gives you an opportunity to point people to Jesus. Just like the little card that you had there in your seat. It's called the best news. So let me just tell you what you can do next time you're having a conversation. An easy way to turn it into a gospel opportunity. You ask somebody how they're doing. And I don't know about you, but most people, when I ask how they're doing, they don't say, great. <laughs> they usually say, okay. Often somebody says something like this, I'm doing all right under the circumstances. <laughs> they share some bad news. And when you're dealing with people's brokenness and their bad news, it gives you an opportunity just to say, do you know that's not the only bad news we have in life? In fact, I read the Bible, I read Scripture, and Scripture is full of of bad news. And one of the things that the Bible says it's bad news, it says that we're all sinners. We're all sinners and that sin separates us from God. And I can reference a verse like Romans 3.23 that says all have sinned. I can reference Romans 6.23 that says the payment, what you earn for your sin is death. And that sin keeps us from God's best. It keeps us from his ideal. So you think you got some bad news? That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. <laughs> there's worse news. The worst news is, is that there's nothing we can do to take care of our sin problem. On our own, 
we're up a creek without a paddle. Because the Bible says it's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's a gift of God. It's not of anything you can do. It's not of your works. There's nothing you can do to get yourself out of this mess. That would be really bad news if that's where it ends. But though I told you the Bible has some bad news, it never stops with the bad news. There's some good news. And the good news is that Jesus did for us what we can't do for ourselves. Jesus paid that punishment for our sin. In fact, there's a verse, 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Friends, I want to tell you today that that's why I like to remind you, it doesn't matter if you've been Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or Episcopal or Presbyterian or Assembly of God or go to a denominational church, wherever your name has been listed on a roll or whatever ritual you've gone through, whether it's church class or First Communion or Confirmation, whether you've been baptized, whether that means dipping or dunking, whatever that means, all of that could take place and you still be separated from God if you haven't understood that it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses you from your sin. That's the good news. But even that's not the best news. The best news is that God, as He forgives us, He gives us eternal life as a free gift. All we have to do is receive it. That same verse that said, the payment, the wages of sin is death, say the gift of God is forever life. It's a gift, but you have to receive it. That's your ticket to heaven. When you get to heaven, if God were to say, why should I let you in? It's not going to be okay to say, I was a member at Mission Hill Church. It's not going to be okay to say, I was baptized. It's certainly not going to be okay to say, my Uncle Bobby was a preacher. Or my Aunt Sally was a prayer warrior. No, what, what God is going to want to know is whether or not you've received his free gift. I was thinking just this morning as I walked over here, I walked past this new picture I have in my office, and it's this big panoramic view from Raymond James Stadium in the football game, the national championship, when the Clemson Tigers beat Alabama. And I was there. A lifetime Clemson Tiger fan, and I was there in the stadium. I had some great seats, but that's a whole other story. But when I got to the stadium, I, I knew that I was going to the game. But you know, when I went to walk in, I, I couldn't tell them, hey, I'm a, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I live a pretty good life. And by the way, I grew up in South Carolina, and the Tigers who are playing here in Tampa, I've been cheering for them since I was a little boy. None of that mattered. I couldn't tell them that I'd... I'd kind of gotten ready, and I brought my youngest son with me, and we were ready for a great day. Just let us in. That didn't matter. I had to have a ticket. The only way I was going to get into that stadium was with a ticket. And the only way you get that free gift that God has prepared for you is when you receive by grace what He has planned for you. Well, Anytime I share something like that, I always say something like, does, does this make sense? Usually the person says yes. And, and if they say yes, I, I then might say, hey, can you think of any reason why you shouldn't accept that free gift that God has for you? And they usually say no. And then I'll say, well, can we just stop right now and pray? And ask God to give you that gift and let you receive it right now. And friend, I'm telling you that because I want you to know that you don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to even have been a Sunday school teacher. If you've been changed by the greatest news, if you've been changed by the best news, all you have to do is share that with someone else and give them an opportunity to experience that same change. See, otherwise, the people you meet, the people I know, they're just going to spend their life craving for more bread, more stuff. But the answer is never going to be more. The answer is always going to be Jesus. Max Lucado put this into an interesting perspective when he wrote this. Consider how bread is made. Think about the process. 
Wheat grows in the field, then it's cut down, it's winnowed and ground into flour. It passes through the fire of the oven, and then it's distributed around the world. Only by this process does bread become bread. Each step is essential. If you eliminate the plant, you have no wheat. If you eliminate the winnowing, you have no flour. If you eliminate the fire, you have no product. Eliminate the distribution, and you have no satisfaction. Each step is essential. Now consider Jesus. He grew up, says Isaiah 53, 2, as a small plant before the Lord. One of millions of boys on the planet, one of thousands in Israel, one of dozens in Nazareth. He was indistinguishable from a person down the street or a child in the next chair. Had you seen him as a youngster, you wouldn't have thought he was the son of God. You might have thought him polite or courteous or diligent, but God on earth? Not a chance. He was just a boy, one of hundreds. He was seen like a staff of wheat in the wheat field. But like wheat, he was cut down. Like chaff, he was pounded and beaten. Isaiah 53, 5 says he was wounded for the wrong we did. And like bread, he passed through the fire of God's anger, not because of his sin, but because of ours. Isaiah 53, 6 declares the Lord has put on him the punishment for all the evil we have done. Jesus experienced each part of the process, making the bread, the growing, the pounding, the firing. And just as each is necessary for regular bread, so was each necessary for Christ to become the bread of life. And then he looks to us to be the distributors. But we're not doing a very good job. And I think I know our problem. It's my problem. I can't get over wanting more bread. I mean, just last Sunday, I went to Carabas. And I don't know what they put in that stuff, but they bring out that little loaf of bread covered up in the basket, and then they pour oil. I think it's just oil. And then they put some spices there, and they tell me to dip my hot bread in that oil with those spices. And good night, it's good. And I just found myself saying... I need some more bread. And then the other day I went to Cheesecake Factory. And at Cheesecake Factory they bring out those warm sourdough loaves. And a a plate of butter. Not margarine. Not, I can't believe it's not butter. They bring out butter. And I put it on the bread. And I just find myself wanting more bread. And then on a special occasion I'll go to the Red Lobster. And at the Red Lobster, they bring out these biscuits. And they got cheese in them. And they're always hot. And they fit right in your mouth whole. And I eat those biscuits. And you know what I want? More biscuits. And so last Sunday on Mother's Day, by the time my steak got to my plate, I was filled up with bread. And I missed out on the best because I'd misunderstood the process. And that's where some of us are. I just want to remind you Jesus didn't come primarily to give you more bread, He came to be the bread. But you got to trust him. You've got to trust that he can do what you can't do. You've got to trust that he sees you when you don't see the way. And you've got to trust that he's enough. I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Now we're in two categories in this room. There's some of you here that you know you've got a relationship with Christ. You know if, if life ended today, you would go to heaven. And that's great. Praise God. But you've still gotten kind of sideways on this issue, and you've not been living as if he is enough, that he's your bread, and you've not been telling others about the bread of life. And so my challenge for you is twofold. My challenge for you is to trust Jesus to be your everything. Some of you gotten kind of sideways looking at the circumstances of the world. You're focusing on the waves and the wind and you forgot that Jesus is with you. 
You're looking at all the people and <laughs> you've forgotten that the one who can turn loaves and fishes into an endless buffet is with you. And you just need to trust him. The second thing I want you to do is maybe to take that little card that I've given you. Hold it in your hand. And just again pray what some of you prayed last week. God, give me a divine appointment. Help, help me tell somebody else about you this week. Help me be faithful. Sharing the bread. The bread of life. And if you're a Christ follower, don't, don't leave this place without some level of that commitment. Because that's God's plan. You're His distribution means. That's the way the message of the bread of life gets out. It's through you, primarily. But somebody's here and you've never begun a relationship with Christ. And for somebody, it's, it's a new revelation to you. In fact, you came in today kind of assuming everything was okay, but you've realized that maybe you were religious, but you don't have a relationship. You've known about God, and you've kind of looked to Him to take care of you, but you've never trusted that He's enough, even if you don't understand. And if that's you today, I want you to trust Him. It's so sweet to trust Jesus. But you've got to trust Him. You've got to have that time where you turn from your sinfulness, you turn from your control, and you turn to Jesus. you got to trust Him. You receive His forgiveness, you accept what He did on the cross, and you trust Him. So if that's you, if you need that relationship with Jesus right where you are right now, I want you to pray this prayer. Not because it's a magic prayer. I just want to help you. I want to help you talk to God and let Him know that you're ready. That you're ready to experience that best news ever. That free gift of heaven. That ticket to heaven that He's got for you. So just say, Dear Jesus. Just you and Him. Say, Dear Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Tell Him, I need you. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, Jesus. I believe you died for my sin. Tell him, I believe you died for my sin. But I believe you're alive today. He is alive. So I receive your forgiveness. Just tell him, I receive your forgiveness. Tell him, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me, Jesus. But here's the big step. I'm, I'm ready to follow you. I trust you. I, I repent. I've, I've been doing it my way, but I trust you, Jesus. Just tell him I trust you, Jesus. I'm following you, Jesus. Take control of my life, Jesus. I tell him thank you. Just a moment more. Our heads are still bowed. We're still in this attitude of prayer, but... I believe somebody here prayed that prayer with me today because I prayed for you to be here. I prayed that God would bring you here, whether you're a church member, maybe even a leader, or whether you're a guest of a friend or a family member today. I pray that you would be here and that God would change your life. Others have prayed for you. Every chair in this room has been prayed over in preparation for this moment. So if you just prayed that prayer with me, or maybe you prayed it in your own words, but you just began a relationship with Jesus, right where you're sitting, would you just lift up your hand and put it right back down? You can do that right now, wherever you are. Just lift up your hand and put it back down. If you did that, that's the most important thing that you could ever do. Welcome to the family of God. He really does love you, and you really can trust Him. So God, I thank you today that you're in the business of changing lives. Now, the greatest miracle you've ever done was not multiplication. No, the greatest miracle you've ever done is salvation. That you've given us that gift of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we do trust you. Even as we sing and celebrate right now. In Jesus' name.